Good evening. Our first guest I'm going to introduce tonight is Carlo Marinucci. Carlo Marinucci is a senior political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, where she has covered national and state politics for the paper since 1996 and writes the Spin Cycle Politics blog. She graduated San Jose State University with a BA in journalism. Carla has been a reporter with Hearst newspapers since 1983. In 2012, the Northern California Society of Professional Journalists awarded Carla um, its Career Achievement Award for her work covering California gubernator gubernatorial elections and presidential elections. Carla has been twice named a media fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. She is a featured political an analyst uh, on KQED's This Week in Northern California and KTVU Fox News Morning on Two. She has also been a guest analyst on CNN, BB, uh, MSNBC, Fox News, Al Jazeera, and Oprah. Carla is a regular analyst for many top radio and broadcasting companies such as BBC, the Australian Broadcasting Company, and National Public Radio. Her husband, Roland, is an award-winning TV producer, and Carla has two sons, Joseph and Antonio. Welcome. Our second guest this evening is Rob Stutzman. Rob Stutzman is the founder and president of Stutzman's Public Affairs, a Sacramento-based firm specializing in campaign, communications, and crisis management. Mr. Stutzman graduated Point Loma College in San Diego with a BA in philosophy. Before founding Stutzman's Public Affair, Rob was a partner in Navigators Global, an issues management and lobbying firm with offices in Washington, D.C., California, and Florida. Previously, Mr. Stutzman was Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. In this capacity, he oversaw press, speech writing, and public appearance for California's celebrity governor. He also served as a co-communications director in the historic California recall of 2003 that placed Schwarzenegger in office. Stutzman is a frequent speaker on California's politics and public policy and regularly appears on television and news shows as political commentator. His opinion articles have been published in most major California newspapers. Mr. Stussman enjoys personal and professional relationships with prominent members of both the national and California media establishment. Welcome. We are also welcoming author Chuck McFadden. Mr. McFadden has covered politics for the Associated Press in Sacramento and also the California Senate in Education. He served as press secretary to State School Superintendent Wilson Riles as Media Relations Direction at California State University in Sacramento. Mr. McFadden also served as Director of Media Services in the Office of the President at University of California. To finish, he is well known for his biography of Governor Jerry Brown called Trailblazer. Last but not least, we are welcoming Professor Izzetti, who taught in the History Department here at St. Mary's. Professor Izzetti attended the University of the Pacific, where he earned his bachelor's and master's degree. His doctorate in history is from the University of California at Berkeley. For some 35 years, he taught American, modern Chinese, and modern Japanese history at St. Mary's. From 1960 to 1995, he was a member of the Christian Brothers Order. His earlier books include a history of the Christian Brothers on the West Coast and a biography of the first American super, superior general. Currently, he lives in retirement in Palm Springs, California, where he spends his time walking, reading, and writing. His History of St. Mary's College will be published on November 19th by the History Press. Thank you all for coming. Carly and Joseph, thank you. Uh, I have an easy job tonight. All I have to do is ask the questions and you have to answer. And then we'll have an opportunity for questions from our wonderful audience. Um, when I was thinking of Jerry Brown, I was thinking also of uh, the fact that he had uh, he has an undergraduate degree from the University of California, Berkeley, in classics. And I just happened to pick up a wonderful little book uh, that was written uh, oh so many years ago by Marcus Julius Cicero, selections from Dave Republica on how to run a country. And uh, some of the advice that uh, Cicero gives is leaders should be of exceptional character and integrity. 
Uh, he, he tells uh, leaders, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. He uh, tells people that intelligence is not a dirty word. Compromise is the key to getting things done. And don't raise taxes unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> so I think uh, Jerry has taken some uh, counsel, wise counsel, from uh, Cicero oh so many years ago. Um, very rarely does a public figure, or really any of us, have more than two or three public lives. In uh, Jerry Brown's case, he has five public lives here in California. And oh, by the way, he ran for president three times. An extraordinary career, and one that is uh, going on very strongly right now in Sacramento and around the state. Uh, Carla, let me begin with you and with Chuck. Uh, in this sense, uh, in one of uh, Carla's articles about the governor, she quotes uh, Willie Brown, the former mayor of San Francisco, who says that um, Jerry Brown is a loner. Kind of a hard thing to be when you're a politician looking for votes. And Chuck, in your, in your book on page 1, 115, you quote uh, Gray Davis, former governor, who says that Jerry Brown is like one of those crystal balls that hangs over the dance floor. He's a man uh, of many facets and interests. And uh, we get confused because we, you and I, citizens and the press, only see one pane of glass at a time. So what is he? Uh, this prism <laughs> or is he this loner? Well, Gray came up with, I think, a very apt description of the multifaceted Jerry Brown. Uh, if there's one thing you can say about Governor Brown, it's that he is a bundle of contradictions. Uh, he is an idealist. He is a practicing, gritty politician. And I think he could probably be called safely one of the most opportunistic politicians to ever appear on the scene in California. He's an extremely agile, intelligent, politician. And Carla, how is he a loner? Well, I mean, I think Chuck talked about the contradictions. Uh, and I think that's really when we talk about Jerry Brown, we're so fortunate from the press point of view to cover a politician that is so many things at once. When you talk about a guy who uh, was mayor of Oakland and is a rancher at the same time, owns, owns a ranch in Calusa County, who uh, worked with Mother Teresa and then uh, used as one of his uh, tenets of his campaigns, the art of war by Sun Tzu. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, he's uh, a guy who on a single day in San Francisco recently was being honored as an environmentalist and was being protested by the fracking guys uh, out in front. I mean, he's sort of, and, and Jerry just likes this, uh, being kind of all Challenged. kinds of challenges to all kinds of uh, groups. I, I, I think that's the fascinating thing. Loner, yes, but at the same time, uh, a guy who's managed to come back now three times and be uh, the youngest governor and at the same time the oldest governor right now in the United States. Now, Rob, you do opposition research. Is there something about Jerry Brown we don't know? <laughs> I, think a, I think there's a great deal about Jerry Brown that we, we don't know and nothing that I would substantiate or break news with here today, but I, mean, I think that's true of all politicians. <laughs> I mean, what the, the remarkable thing about Governor Brown, as Carla's indicated, um, is the, the ability to be so many different things. And if you look at his career, uh, he has been, you could put him in so many different categories. Yeah. Uh, as the, He was Howard Dean before Howard Dean in 1992 running for president. And then stayed in that race a long time vindictively to people living crap out of Bill Clinton for a while just because he wanted to. And then he departed from the scene for quite a while. And I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the governor personally well enough to overly speculate, but I think he probably went through a lot of soul searching in that time. He reemerges as a very pragmatic, practical mayor of Oakland who actu actually re-registered. Re he left the Democrat Party, became an independent, and um, was essentially, fairly, I think, fairly categorized as a pro-business mayor of Oakland. And then he arrives today at this place in life where uh, he is a governor that has had all this experience priorly, prior being in the office, having sought the presidency, been a can-do pragmatic mayor, 
And in his personal life went through the transformation, I think, of, of finding a spouse and a companion that I, I, I'll, I'll say I think balances him in a, in a very substantive and wonderful way. And you have, and he doesn't have, of course, who knows, but I don't think he has another run for the White House in him. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a few minutes. In a few minutes, but it, it allows him to be this, I call him the, the philosopher king um, in this last stage of his public life. And uh, he is the most interesting person that cannot really be categorized other than that he is Jerry. Uh, Ron Izzetti, I was reading a wonderful monograph that you uh, wrote recently, which connects Jerry Brown as a Jesuit, having Jesuit training with the Christian Brothers. You want to just elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, delighted to. Uh, Jerry Brown studied for the priesthood for three years and was going to become a Jesuit. What's interesting is, from my point of view, his chief advisor as governor of California and as campaign director was a former Christian brother. This is one of the few times when Christian brothers and Jesuits <laughs> I never worked together. <laughs> cooperate. Uh, his chief aide was a good friend of mine. Well, he, he still is. His name is Gilbert Chatfield. He was a very prominent Christian brother who left the order to join Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. He then became uh, Governor Brown's chief of staff along with Gray Davis and his campaign director in his runs for the presidency. So this is one of the few instances when Christian brothers and Jesuits cooperate. Because as all of you know, when St. Mary's plays Santa Clara or USF <laughs> or Gonzaga, uh, there's a lot of fighting rivalry. I think one of the keys to understanding Governor Brown is his Jesuit background. Uh, there's no mono explanation for who he is as a person. But can't you trace back his simple lifestyle at least until recently, to his Jesuit roots. He drove around in an old Plymouth. Can't you trace back his concern for social justice and the farm workers to his religious background? Um, can't you even see a kind of Jesuitical cerebral quality to his mind? So I think that part of Brown is a very important facet of this total personality. It's not the whole story by any stretch of the imagination. But to ignore that is to ignore an important part of what makes Governor Brown a different kind of politician. Now, I uh, had the privilege of uh, being in a parish, St. Joseph the Worker in Berkeley, as a, as a resident for a number of years. And there was a legendary priest there by the name of Bill O'Donnell. And Bill just collected all sorts of people. You come down to breakfast and Martin Sheen would be there, or one of the Berrigan brothers. Well, occasionally Mayor Brown, he was mayor at the time, would come for breakfast. And breakfast began after the 8 o'clock mass, about 8.30, quarter to 9. And if Jerry Brown were there, a breakfast would kind of go into like 12.30. It would be like lunch. Uh, and uh, he, he, between the two of them and those of us who were lucky enough to listen in, uh, there was quite a hefty dialogue about all sorts of things. I mean, a man has a range of knowledge that's quite quite amazing for a public leader. You, you know, when you think about it, uh, it just even uh, in the late 1990s, Jerry Brown was a talk show host mm -hmm. on KPFA. That's right. Interviewing Catholic philosophers, uh, you know, authors. Uh, at the time, he's living in a loft in Oakland. Uh, had no wife at the time. I mean, I mean the, the, the most completely different guy than you can imagine than the guys running California today. But that aspect of his life, if you go back and look at the transcripts of these KPFA shows, he had long involved and 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 very deep conversations. Yeah. We made sure we found those transcripts. <laughs> That's right. You did. And those some of those conversations were used against him sure. in some of the campaigns, correct, yeah. Ron? Sure. I mean he uh, well, I go back to the you know the, the philosopher King. He's kind of, he has led life. Uh, rather publicly, I think, with a bit of an attitude of a, of a philosopher, certainly inquisitive, 
certainly eager to share his opinion. <laughs> uh, but, but that's okay. I mean, especially in this day and age of inauthenticity with so many politicians and a lack of, of uh, intellectual courage, um, although I've accused him of lacking it at times. Uh, he, he, is a, he is from a different, different era of believing that governing comes from the higher thoughts of people like Cicero. The, by the way, I, he may have a signed copy of that. Oh, he's the oldest. Governor. From 64 BC, that's kind of <laughs> hard to figure. Uh, but let me let me continue the conversation, though, uh, in the sense that experience does count. Uh, can you guys uh, and Carla, could you uh, compare and contrast the the Jerry Brown first term, uh, first two years, first two terms as governor, and the Jerry Brown as he's taken over the job now? And what has he changed substantially? Well, I mean, the stories in Sacramento of the Grateful Dead, you know, sleeping overnight in the governor's office and leaving their, the butts of their, their jays laying around afterward. I mean, we, we don't hear stories like that anymore. So I think, you know, he was the bachelor governor uh, and I think enjoyed a bit of the celebrity back then and really embraced it and sought it. And he, it, it really is antithetical to that now. Uh, Chuck, what do you think? Yes, exactly right, Rob. He, he's, he's not breaking the crockery anymore like he was yeah. in his first uh, term. Uh, he's much more subdued. I think a lot of the rough edges have been sanded off. Doug Fagan, his press secretary back then, says that uh, Jerry's much more interested in listening to other people now. He's a, he's a <laughs> kinder, gentler man now than he was then. But one of the things that has always fascinated me about this guy is, as I mentioned earlier, he is the most opportunistic politician in California while still somehow preserving an aura of idealism. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example. When he was a community college trustee way back in the late 60s, uh, nobody out there probably remembers this, but the free speech movement at Berkeley in a way, put Ronald Reagan in the White House because there was a big chunk of the California electorate that was turned off by these ungrateful, rioting, disorderly students. And Reagan's handlers jumped on that. They weren't the only people to jump on that. Jerry Brown jumped on that. He advocated back then, way back then, formation of a airborne strike force which would use jet planes to travel around the country to put down student <laughs> unrest with rubber bullets and water hoses to quell uh, student unrest. Jerry realized that a big chunk of the California electorate in the mid to late 60s was very upset with college students and he jumped on that. Fortunately, uh, it didn't really come to pass, but he did advocate that. Okay. Uh, I guess the point I want to make here, or at least the question I want to get at is, you mentioned Ronald Reagan, who thought government was and is the problem. Whereas in a way, um, Jerry Brown comes into office again, uh, but in a way his, uh, he, has, he believes that intelligent government can keep us from going off the, the cliff. And in a sense, um, I think the second ter term of duty, uh, the, 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 his third election to governorship, uh, is much more challenging than when he first came in, even though yeah. th there may have been unrest in the country, uh, uh, but that unrest was due to other things far beyond his control. Whereas the California governance, and you mentioned it so much in your book, uh, the con California Constitution, our initiatives and what have you, tie the hands of everybody, seemingly. Yeah, I mean, when he, when he came in uh, to office in the third term, uh, look, California was looking like a place that was uh, quickly going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, the, the debt was so high, it looked ungovernable. You, you documented it so well in your book, uh, Chuck. Uh, uh, and it looked like anybody who wanted this job was just absolutely insane. Uh, now, I mean, that's what's so interesting about the stories that are being written about him today when you talk about him being opportunistic. Somehow he has really has managed to emerge as being one of the few governors uh, in the United States uh, that has somehow risen above the partisanship uh, and, and, has, and, and really has managed to sort of seem to be succeeding. Although if we look at the LA Times poll yes. this week, 
Um, he still gets some challenges here too. 55%, the latest poll this week shows 55% of uh, Californians approve of Jerry Brown, but only about a third will, would vote for him again in the next election. Uh, what does that mean? I think there's, that's open to a lot of analysis. Maybe there's no, right now we don't know who the Republican challenger might be. Elections are about choices. At the same time, the feeling is, has Brown, has Jerry Brown in this term made enough of a case to himself to yeah. people? Has he put himself out there enough with, well, uh, with well, the with electorate? Well, with Proposition 13, way back when, yeah. and of course Proposition 30, which he successfully campaigned for, one could argue that he's kind of a flip-flopper. Uh, in a sense, because you know, he's on various sides of an issue. But in fact, a, a lot of the best writing about leadership tells us about adaptive leadership to be able to meet the genuine needs of constituents. Um, Rob, how do you see it? Is he a flip-flop or is he adaptive to the, to the situation that's <laughs> well, there? Well, yes, uh, both. But uh, I mean, flip-flopper is, is a pejorative way to, to, to make the, the charge. And it has to do with, you know, when someone has a transition in, in, a, in, a, in a point of view, how effectively do they communicate or make the case that they are doing so for sound reasons? Now, when Jerry Brown woke up the day after Prop 13 passed and became for Prop 13 after opposing it, at that time it may not have appeared as, as genuine, and that could maybe be characterized as flip-flopping. But if you look at him now, I think it's very interesting, one of the most accomplished things he's done which is a, is a boring issue, it's not, nothing sexy about it at all, but he has devolved custody of, of the incarcerated down to the local level and has basically shifted how we, we do custody, it's called realignment, custody in this state um, of prisoners down to the county level and now it's funding it that way and there's a lot of efficiencies that can probably be gained that way, it's probably smart, good devolution of government from being centralized. But he is also very, very concerned um, about letting any of these, anyone out of prison early, which is why he has fought like a Republican, using almost the verbiage of George Duke Majin of the 80s, in fighting these federal judges who are telling him he must reduce the prison population in California. I would suggest that's a practical perspective and political perspective on, on his part, uh, because he knows that if anything may imperil his reelect, it could be if all of a sudden crime became this out of control, extraordinary issue, and he let someone out of prison. But he has fought tooth and nail against these federal judges, much harder than my old boss Schwarzenegger did. And, and I think it's actually turned into a political plus for him. So there may be, I don't, you know, when he goes to bed at night, I really don't know where his heart may be today. But he has very effectively made the case that that is a transition maybe in what he has thought mm -hmm. in the past when it comes to incarceration and probably can't be accused of flip flopping. Uh, well, I was going to say, isn't that one of many issues, really, where he's shown himself to be, as you said, sort of adaptive leader? Uh, you look at guns and the issue, the gun control issues yeah. that have just come before him. Uh, some of those bills he he signed, like lead ammunition, a ban on lead ammunition. Others, like the Steinberg bill, which calls for calls for really tougher. Uh, sanctions on uh, on uh, assault weapons and, and, and large magazines, he vetoed. Um, on on environmental issues, he's been very strong. But on fracking, he's getting a lot of flack from environmentalists because mm -hmm. he's saying, "Look, let's look at this a little more." I mean, is I think that's one of the secrets of where he's at right now. You've said it before. Everyone re repeats this line that Jerry Brown has used: "Paddle to the right, paddle to the left," and he's managed to just. Take it. Well, let me ask Ron Izzetti, do you think that uh, President Obama could take a few lessons from Jerry Brown? <laughs> uh, I don't presume to uh, give lessons to either one of them. But I think Jerry Brown is, is basically a pragmatist. I don't think he's a doctrinaire liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, his recent actions would belie that, that characterization. Um, I am not really good at the political parts. You guys are better at that, so I'm going to let you uh, talk about it. But I, my, my main point is I don't think he's an ideological liberal. Uh, I think his, his instincts move in that direction. But his whole attitude about gun control, for example, is, is, is pretty moderate. I, I don't think he's an ideological liberal. Well, let me move on to what's next uh, and who's next. Um, Rob, you may have the best insight into this. I, I was listing people that I thought could uh, 
run for governor um, of the state of California. I was um, primarily looking at uh, well-heeled uh, Silicon Valley uh, types. Um, the uh, former co-inventor or creator of PayPal, Peter Thiel. Um, I was thinking also of this young guy who was a protege of the uh, uh, former Senator Jim DeMinge, who runs the Heritage Action F the Foundation, uh, Michael Need uh, uh, Need Needham. Um, we have other people out there, uh, Tim Donnelly from uh, Southern California, and Abel Maldonado. Uh, Maldonado. Can you uh, add to that list? Um, I, sure, I'll add, a, I'll add at least one name. Well, I'll add a couple of names to that, that list. There has been talk about those that are wealthy and can self-fund. In California, of course, there's such an ex takes a extraordinary amount of money to communicate your message, and our contribution limits are, in my opinion, so small that you can never raise enough money through conventional means in order to really have a, a well-funded campaign, unless you're an incumbent or can seed the campaign with a lot of your own money. So you automatically look for rich people, um, which I think is unfortunate. There are two other names uh, in addition to Donnelly, who this past week announced. And Donnelly is an assemblyman from a very conservative district in Southern California, Inland Empire, San Bernardino County, who came to the assembly kind of on the back of being one of the, the Minutemen, those guys who would sit down at the border in their lawn chairs and wander the, the, the border. He's one of the most conservative members of the legislature. Uh, Abel Maldonado, just briefly, former state senator, former lieutenant governor, ran for Congress and lost uh, two years, well, a year ago, will be two years. Uh, interesting, um, Latino Republican, has been in office, bit of a mod, defined as a moderate, certainly has, has voted for some taxes in the past, which is the litmus. There's two other people that have publicly identified that they're considering the race. One's a former congressman from the Central Valley. George Rodanovich, who has a little bit of money that he may be able to spend. George was known as a c conservative, but one of those genteel conservatives when he was in Congress. And he'd be an interesting candidate. He'd be, he'd be very credible. The other is a, a, a man probably none of you have heard of, unless you constantly read Carla's blog, which you should. Uh, Neil Kashkari uh, is somebody who is certainly in, the, in an exploratory phase. Uh, he is the, a former uh, Wall Street banker. Doesn't sound too good, right? <laughs> Former uh, administrator of the TARP program at the Bush Treasury Department. Doesn't sound too good. Uh, but he also went on to administer TARP uh, for President Obama, and he voted for President Obama. And he has taken a very interesting tact of spending a lot of time around the state uh, in all of California's communities, learning about all the issues facing all of California's communities. And I think he would be interesting because he's not a politician. He's a bit atypical. There's some narrative problems that people like me would be concerned about, like uh, Goldman and TARP. But he could be he could be interesting, and it would be to me be fascinating to see Jerry Brown, the unconventional old politician in his last campaign, possibly face off against someone who also is unconventional. Like, if nothing else, it may make for a, a bit more of a an, an interesting intellectual campaign. But, but let's remember the last gubernatorial race. Uh, which I covered, which you certainly uh, were in on. I mean, uh, Jerry Brown was up against somebody who a lot of people thought, wow, she's going to present a big problem. And Meg Whitman, uh, the, one of the co-founders of eBay, spent $187 million trying to become governor of California, about $150 million of that her own money. And we know where Governor Whitman is today. <laughs> well, she's running Turning you know, around HP. Billy Packard. Um, yeah. But she found out that up against Jerry Brown, was, who was as cheap as you could get on the campaign trail in terms of spending money, uh, yes. he didn't have, you know, she had the 50 page booklets of how she was going to turn around California. She had millions of dollars of ads. And we'll all remember the day that Jerry Brown just rolled out his first uh, introduction to his campaign, just him with a brick wall behind him, and saying, uh, at this stage in my life, I know what I want to do to turn around California. And it was the strongest possible uh, argument you could make at that point. He looked like the adult in the room. And uh, he, he also that, took away the issue. Uh, I worked for the Whitman campaign. Uh, took away the issue that we needed, and that was taxes. And he said there would not be taxes without a vote of the people. And he held to that. Uh, I think you have to give him a lot of credit for holding to that. I think 
<laughs> not many politicians would have. And he came under a lot of pressure so from within of, his own party not to do one that. One of the problems that the Whitman campaign had uh, is that they had so darned much money, they choked on it. <laughs> Steve Glazer, who was out there somewhere in the audience, told me when I was doing the research for the book that uh, his greatest fear was that the Whitman campaign would go dark on television after the bitter, nasty Republican primary, give people a little relief, and then start again on Labor Day. But the Whitman campaign did not do that. They continued unabated all the way up to Labor Day. And then Jerry launched his campaign. And Which was quite late. I mean, quite late. Many, well, and the I, I, result I, I, of that was that 72-year-old Jerry Brown, the most incumbent politician in the history of California, somehow became the fresh new face on television. <laughs> there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of truth to, to that. Uh, we, you know, women did end up becoming overexposed, I believe, by the end of the campaign. But for accuracy's sake, I have to interject that the labors undertook a multi-million dollar independent expenditure on behalf of Brown during the summer. So it's not as if Whitman was unabated on the air throughout the summer. That, there was something also bracketing her. But I will say, too, from a press point of view, somebody covered both of these candidates, there was a major difference in terms of the transparency and the accessibility of these two candidates. And this is where you see Jerry Brown being totally comfortable as somebody who's been in this game for so long. Meg Whitman actually got the reputation, got, was labeled runaway Meg, because when you try to ask her a question, she would literally run out the door, and you get that great video of her with her the, back <clears throat> to the camera, and she, she freaked out. Although, how many times did that happen? A, a couple of times, well, one, and that was enough to, to brand her as runaway Meg. And, and, and I think that's where it became almost a storyline in the press, because Jerry Brown, we went on a, at least one uh, campaign swing with him through Northern California, I remember. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, we'd be up in Eureka somewhere, and the reporters, we'd be in a bar, you know, just talking about the race, and there's here with Jerry come into the bar and sit down with us, and of course, well, with his frugal nature, not order anything, but just eat off all of our plates, <laughs> and that's. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let, let me, let me, before we have questions, let me just do one more forecasting. Uh, a great governor has to leave a, a legacy, an accomplishment. Um, it's interesting that Pope Francis is the same age as Jerry Brown. They're both 76. So the likelihood is, let's say he continues as governor, he runs again, let's say he gets elected. What is going to be his accomplishment? Will it be um, something as uh, extended uh, revision of the California tax code? Is that possible? <laughs> uh, is it high-speed trains? Is it education? Uh, smaller but more intelligent government? Uh, water distribution? Trade with China? Uh, what, what one thing could mark an accomplishment of uh, Jerry Brown in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, what would be a fourth term? Well, I think Carla and Rob will have their own thoughts on this, but back when he was a young man and his father, Pat Brown, was pouring cement and building California's infrastructure like mad, Jerry did not exactly sneer at that, but that wasn't his thing. He was interested in appointing minorities to high positions in state government and Roseburg, to the state Supreme Court, and so on. Now, he seems to be very interested in leaving a, you should excuse the expression, concrete legacy. He's pushing high-speed rail, and he's pushing the peripheral tunnels. I, I think he wants to leave something behind uh, other than he was a good manager in tough times, mm -hmm. or he kept things on an even keel. Mm -hmm. What kind of a legacy is that for a man with Jerry Brown's ego? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Water conveyance, absolutely, and it, it's hard <clears throat> to understand why that's important, but I would hope history would be fair to him if he's able to accomplish this, that it, for the future of the state, it's, it's, it would be significant if he's able to get this done. Uh, I also think reorganizing government. I think what he's done on the correction side with realignment, he wants to replicate with delivery of other services, and again, while not really sexy and interesting, it is significant and very important for the future of the state. And I, I, I believe he wants to do more of that in, in a second term, I would expect that. 
I think high-speed rail, which he is infatuated with, imperils his legacy. It has boondoggle written all over it, and it does not have, um, it does not have public support, and I think he has to be very careful with that, mm -hmm. um, or it, it, it could become his punchline of that mm -hmm. last fourth term, uh, as opposed to these other things, which would really be su substantial. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Rob. I think that high-speed rail is the thing that he is looking at as being uh, the, the plan that's going to carry his name into the future. I, but I think there are a lot of challenges with that. Uh, and, and one of them being, that, especially for those of us who live in this area, we're more interested in like, how do we get every day from San Jose to San Francisco and not San Francisco to LA? And I think that's the sales job he's got to make on this project. George Skelton, the longtime, sometimes acerbic <laughs> political economist for the Los Angeles Times, says that Jerry is for high-speed rail because Jerry thinks it's groovy. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I was going to end this by simply by saying that uh, the Roman emperors actually liked aqueducts and <laughs> built roads, and maybe he's listening in a sm small way to Cicero. Uh, it's time for questions. I want to bring back uh, Vincent and Carly for the first round of questions, then we'll open it up to everyone else. So many political leaders, could you personally tell the good from the bad? And did any particular leaders stand out to you? Good leaders, bad leaders. Who are they? The name names on the bad, that's just seems so impolite. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give two examples. I'll give an example of a good from California, and I, I believe that's Governor Pete Wilson who I think history is treating well, and who understood an arc of governing and things he had to do to govern well that took him down into some depths with public opinion. If you look at governors, and governors are who to look at more than presidents, that do reforms in their states, Democrat or Republican, they're willing to ride down public opinion through the reform in order to come back out of it once it's successful. And I think Governor Wilson had a pretty good legacy of that. Um, the governor that came after him, who I, I don't, I don't like to uh, to bash because he was he was recalled, but he didn't respond to you know, Governor Davis did not respond to crisis, and everything was always through a political lens, and I think ultimately it led to his his political demise. Ron, I don't think we should forget his father. I don't think we should forget the establishment of the University of California mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should forget the Central Valley Project. I think his father, Pat Brown, was one of the greatest governors uh, that California has ever had. And if his son can meet the standard the father set, he will be judged a successful governor in my opinion. I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but uh, I think all of California's governors within memory have done their damnedest in the job whether it was Pat Brown or Jerry or Arnold or Ronald Reagan. I think they all tried hard within their lights and limitations to uh, do the best they could for the people of California. I don't think there was a cynical person among them. Jerry's a little cynical sometimes, but you know, generally he's something of an idealist. However, however, if I may be permitted, members of the California legislature have not always been statesmen. There is the uh, story of a state senator who stood up on the floor of the California Senate one day and waved a Los Angeles Times editorial in the air talking about the state budget. And the headline said, if this budget passes, we face fiscal chaos. This state senator stood up and said, if this budget passed, the Times says it right here, we face Fiscal choas. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. This one is for Professor Zetti. Um, with your knowledge of history, do you think leadership has changed over time? I do. And the reason I like Governor Brown is because he's intellectual. Now, maybe that's his Jesuit background. But I think he likes to play with ideas. According to Gilbert Chatfield, he can have tunnel vision. 
and Gilbert Leroy, his religious name was Gilbert, uh, was very upset by that sometimes. He would zero in on one problem and everything else uh, would get out of focus. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I, th I think he's an excellent governor, and I think part of the reason is that he's intelligent. Being a college professor, I have a natural bias for people who like to play with ideas. And he's not afraid to play with ideas. And I like governors who do that. Vincent. Uh, so both my questions tonight are for the, the whole panel. Uh, the first one is, I'm assuming every political leader's dream is to make everyone happy. Um, but how does uh, one, and in this case Jerry Brown, know what to prioritize and what decisions to make uh, for the good of the people versus what the people want? It's a good question. I don't, I, and I think Jerry Brown is one political leader who really doesn't look at the polls. Uh, as much as, say, some of the other others out there. I think he, he came in with certain views as to what he needed to do in California, and Prop 30 was a good example of the taxes. A lot of people uh, said that was a no, non-starter and was, would never pass. And he um, insisted and, and fought for it and uh, brilliantly put it over the top. He yeah, didn't look at the That's polls. a great question to ponder. Yeah. I do, it, just kinda, it goes back to a politician in their last ro at their last rodeo. I don't think, and this is why he undersells himself, I believe, to the public. He almost doesn't really care what the voters think because he knows what he wants to do and what's right and what will work. And it, it's this exhausting labor almost to have to go explain it to the people. Now, you can look at that as a bit of arrogance, and I think there's a tad of it. But I also just think, he doesn't necessarily need that anymore. Now, it's showing a little bit in the polling we've talked about. He's got to be a little bit careful of that because he's good at selling what he's doing. Did it very well during Prop 30. Um, but I think he, he, in his own mind at this stage, he knows what the, the priorities are. He knows what he wants to get done. And some of the prioritization has to do with the politics of Sacramento and when he can pull certain levers. But I think he sees a, a path. He just may not always reveal what it is. He, uh you have to remember that Proposition 30, uh, fairly consistently, for quite a while, was pretty low in the polls. Mm -hmm. The conventional wisdom is that unless you have above 50% on your proposition, you're not going to get it through. That's right. And uh, Jerry, to his credit, put his political credibility, put his political life on the line and campaigned ferociously for that because he thought it was the thing to do. On the day before the balloting began, Carla probably knows this better than anyone, he rocketed around the state, right. visited five cities, pushing Proposition 30, and he got it over. That was a personal political victory for Jerry Brown against what seemed to be earlier very tough odds. Final question. Um, in our class this semester, through books and discussions, we've questioned the notion of are leaders born or are they made? What is your point of view on this when thinking of Jerry Brown? I think he was born into a circumstance in which, uh, I mean, he, it, it's in, this is in his DNA, watching his father. Uh, I mean, this is the, the, the unique thing about Jerry Brown as a politician is you can go with him up and down the state as we did during the campaign, and in almost every community he went into, whether it's some small town or a big city, he had a personal connection to it. You know, oh, here we are, my dad took me here as a kid on the campaign, or my grandmother's buried right down the road, or I've been here a million times because, uh, you know, my ranch is here. It's a guy who understands who is about California. He really does love California, and he knows it up and down. So I think because he was born into it. Um, and that's such a unique situation. And I, and I agree with everything about he was born into it very uniquely, but I, but I also think this third term governor we see, and this gentleman is 76 years of age, um, is, is made. I think it's his full experience that now is largely informing the way he governs, but he certainly was born yeah. into this. Yeah, imagine, the, dynasty. imagine the, the brown dinner table in San Francisco when Jerry was growing up 
Pat Brown ran for the assembly as mm -hmm. a Republican, by the way, and lost. He ran for district attorney and lost, and finally got district attorney in San Francisco. I mean, the conversation had to be about moving masses of people in one direction or the other. He, uh, he just, he, he was marinated in politics from a very early age. Ron, I'll give you the final word. I think his training as a Jesuit is an important factor. <laughs> it gave him a critical mind. It gave him a passion for social justice. Um, and I, I wouldn't downplay that. Uh, it was a formative part of his life. And even though he's strayed since, uh, one can still see within him his background. Idealism tempered by practical politics. Um, loving to play with ideas. Um, an idealism tempered by political reality. Um, a resilience. He made some bad turns with Rose Bird, for example. But he reinvented himself. And I think a lot of his background uh, in the Jesuits still shines through. Uh, so I think he's a unique politician. I think he's more cerebral than most politicians. I think he's more idealistic than most politicians. More important, I think he's I'm searching for a word and I'm not going to find it. He is more willing to take risks for his beliefs. Um, and on the other hand, he's a consummate politician. Mm -hmm. So that kind of combination of a consummate politician, who, who's made some pretty bad mistakes too, with an idealist, um, I think is very potent. And I think it serves California well. Well, I want to thank our guests this evening. Before we open it up to general questions, I want to thank them for a wonderful dialogue. Let's take a minute for a deep breath. And I want to bring Tim Farley back up to hold the microphone for us so that those of you who have been so wonderful and patient in, the, in our uh, audience congregation can uh, ask your questions. And, Tim will bring the, the will bring the microphone to you. Um, this is a great dialogue. I mean, well, thank you. Uh, we uh, we did our we did our job. Uh, let's corner Q this way. Would someone, those of you who have questions, please come forward. And don't be bashful. <laughs> Would you identify yourself, please, I, don't Jimmy surrender. I, I won't surrender the mic. So you don't, you, yeah, you, you will not get the mic out of my hand. Very simply, what will Jerry Brown's legacy be as mayor of Oakland? Ooh. Oh, boy. I, we have two you know, residents of I, Oakland. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Jerry Brown, some of the incredible, I live in Oakland, so I can tell you this, some of the incredible growth and vitality that you see in Oakland today. If any of you have ever been to a First Friday event there, which is amazing, they, these you know, tens of thousands of people show up to incredible music, uh, you know, festivities, all kinds of things. Uh, the kind of restaurant growth, the kind of downtown growth. He's the guy who said he would bring 10,000 residents to the downtown, and people said, oh, sure. And there they are now. I mean, uh, a lot of the, the, the great stuff that's happening in Oakland, with a lot of young people moving in, tech startups, I think you can you can uh, credit Jerry Brown for a lot of the um, policies that were put in place when he was mayor. He, he took a lot of heat for it, uh, but I think that is one of the reasons Oakland uh, has a lot of stuff going on right now. Well, we've talked a lot about Jerry and his family and his religion, and we haven't touched yet upon the women in his life mm -hmm. and the impact that Linda Ronstadt and Ann Gust <laughs> have had upon Jerry Brown. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, and I'm just going to take 
a little bit of it. I mean, I think you ha you have to credit in Gus and uh, Rob. You did. I mean, I think just about everybody does. Uh, everybody does who's ever met this woman. Um, you know, like I said, in 1996, the guy was a lonely bachelor talk show host, okay? And um, this woman who he's been with now for, I guess, I don't know, 20, 20 years now, well, whatever, um, she's, it, she's a balance to him. She is somebody who is, I mean, she's a sharp uh, attorney on her own. She un uh, clearly understands policy and by all accounts, um, has a huge influence on him up in Sacramento every day, and he said it himself. I, yeah, I don't. I'm a political. I'm a political hack. I'm not. A, I'm a psychoanalyzer. There's, there's something. I, I've researched this man's life extensively because I've run a camp, helped run a campaign against him. This is a. There's a health <clears throat> to the life he has with Anne that I think reflects in his public life, and uh, I don't. I think. You know, I think he's very forthcoming about this. I believe that I don't. He wouldn't be here, what he's doing, what, with without her. It's a tradition among, and Rob would know this better than I, but I'll say it anyway. It's a tradition among campaign managers that the spouse of the candidate is usually a king size pain in the neck, and uh, Steve uh, Glazer will testify to the fact that Anne uh, was a terrific app, uh, asset to the campaign and uh, stabilizes Jerry, kept him focused, and kept him headed in the right direction. Speaking, however, of the women in Jerry Brown's life, long before Linda Ronstadt, there was a young woman called Karen, and my wife uncovered Karen when we were doing research on Jerry at USC. Karen wrote Jerry a bittersweet birthday card, and it was covered on both sides with handwriting that I could barely make out. And Karen said there was a new man in her life, and Jerry gave her things, and it was too bad that they couldn't fit the pieces together, and so on and so forth. Jerry wrote Karen immediately a typewritten reply. <laughs> the letter was five paragraphs long, and two of the paragraphs were about his new job as California Secretary of State. <laughs> Jerry was not the last of the romantics. He, he wouldn't have been much of a texter this day. No, no, yeah. no. Well, I'm going to take a little prerogative right now because I do have the mic and I'm not going to surrender it. But following up on that, and you talked about the women in Jerry's life. We talked about Linda Ronstadt. We talked about Ann Guest. We also touched on uh, Pat Brown. But could you mention the influence of Bernice Brown on Jerry and, and his life today? Bernice uh, Brown was a very pretty, highly intelligent woman. Uh, she was, well, I say woman. First of all, identify who she is. Yeah, she, I'm sorry. Bernice Brown is Jerry Brown's mother, Pat Brown's wife. A highly intelligent woman that Pat Brown fell in love with when Bernice was 12 years old. Bernice's father was a police uh, lieutenant on the San Francisco police force and didn't believe that his 12-year-old daughter should be going with anybody at that stage. Um, she did not enjoy politics. She pretty much stayed out of the limelight as, as much as she could. But few people know that after he was walloped by Ronald Reagan, lost by almost a million votes, four years later, Pat Brown was thinking about running against Ronald Reagan to try to regain the governorship. And Bernice pointed out that since Jerry was running for Secretary of State, two Edmund G. Browns on the ballot would not be a good thing. So she dissuaded her husband, Pat, from foolishly trying to run against Ronald Reagan. Uh, Jess Unruh, as it turns out, ran against Ronald Reagan and lost by about half a million votes. And, and, well, but while we're on the subject of the Brown family, we have to bring up one other Brown who I think is very important, especially today, and that's Sutter Brown. Yeah. Sutter Brown, for those of you who don't know, is California's first dog, the little corgi that Jerry Brown has. And if you want to talk about how savvy this guy is, I'm talking about Jerry Brown and his wife, this little dog has a, like, how many Twitter followers? 30,000? You know, it's like ridiculous. Uh, he has turned this dog into a symbol of, like, the every man that he is. 
the dog is the most popular thing up in the Capitol. He's walked every day by Steve Glazier and others. And some, if you're lucky, oh. you get to walk the dog yourself. But this, Recently a lobbyist. We, we said, and, yeah. <laughs> and by lobbyists, Stephen, um, we, you know, the, the symbol of Jerry Brown in the old days was the old Plymouth, you know, as being the, the, the every man that he is. Today, it's the dog, and it's been hugely successful. And I think it's one more example of Jerry Brown being a well, consummate, just, like, image maker. Well, let me just maker. continue the legacy. <laughs> are there Browns in, in line? He, they, do, they do not have children. At least he does not have children. No. But are there any Browns, uh, Kathleen Brown, Dan Gordon Sauter children out there somewhere who are, might continue the Brown legacy? But not that I'm aware of. I don't, no, I don't no, think yeah. Kathleen would run again. Yeah. Um, she ran and lost to Pete Wilson in 1994, of course, when she was sitting state treasurer. Uh, I, and I'm obviously not the best qualified as a Republican to answer that, but not that I'm aware of. Okay. Governor Brown being talking about a philosopher king or philosopher governor, I'm wondering if the panel can talk about uh, specific policy matters that he's brought up, say, as a philosopher king or philosopher governor that we would not have seen on, in previous governors, either back in the 70s or in his current uh, term. So these would be type of issues you wouldn't have seen Gray Davis spring up or Pete Wilson just because of his unique background. So I want to see what, what are concrete examples of our philosopher governor. Well, when I, you know, I used to say philosopher king. Some of that is the way I believe he deliberates over bills that come before him. Um, I mean, just things I'm aware of from being in Sacramento of how he goes about seeking input and coming to some decisions. I mean, not not to not to be overboard this, but I come back to the realignment issue that I, I've brought up uh, before. I mean, there's really no reason to do that except other than his in his mind how the design of government could change and become more more efficient. I mean, I think that's a good example of it. Um, look, and I think on envi look at environmental back yeah. in the, back in the '70s, he was one of the first guys pushing talking about. Uh, uh, stuff that a, a lot of people, he was way ahead of the curve in terms of environmental climate change issues on, on technology true. issues, Governor Moonbeam, um, and now today, uh, you know, talking about satellites back then in the 70s, he was I, sort of grand as being in that. Yeah, thing. more of it may have become public back in the 70s when he would maybe think out loud a bit more, but the mind is still active, I think, in the same way. I want to add to Office of Appropriate Technology. I think he had a whole part of the government that was coming up. <laughs> yeah, his science advisor was Rusty Schweikert, who was an astro right. uh, uh, astronaut. That's right. right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he, he did lots of idealistic things the first time around. He won labor bargaining rights for farm workers in California, which was a real uphill thing. He, uh, he did that out of his idealism. I was just curious about what you had mentioned about prisons um, and what he had done for that and how he made, um, how he, I guess, wanted the people to stay in for their full term and their full sentence. Had he done anything else for the prisons? You mentioned he had done a couple things and I wasn't sure. I was just curious. Let me make sure I understand your question. So yeah. more, what, how, what's the contrast of, of difference between the first governorship and second governorship on um, no, I, no, just curious in general about what he had done for the prison, prison system. Okay. Well, so what's going on today, what he's doing about it, it's one of the issues that is really occupying him because there's, uh, there's been a federal lawsuit mm -hmm. now, it's been alive for about, about 10 years, filed by lawyers representing prisoners that California's prisons are overcrowded, therefore inhumane, and don't provide proper health care. So federal judges actually have control over the health care system of, of, of our state prisons. And then on this overcrowding issue, they've said you have to reduce the population uh, by, by X amount. What he is doing is finding ways to, by, well, partly by contracting the private prisons, keep everyone incarcerated that is currently incarcerated and not release them early just because these federal judges are telling him that he needs to do that. He is attacking that with a vigor that, um, in a blind taste test, you would think is probably a Republican governor, for instance. Uh, he also is interestingly arguing and asserting his state's rights uh, against the federal government when it comes to this. Now, he keeps going to the Supreme Court and losing, but he is fighting 
like mad to assert the principle that this, his state should be able to run prisons the way he wants to, essentially. And, you know, that's a very federalist idea, and you don't necessarily see a lot of Democrat governors around America fighting hard for that principle. I hope that addressed your question. Okay. Hi. I'm from Detroit. And uh, how close can I be? You won't relinquish. <laughs> um, I'm from Detroit. I teach here at uh, St. Mary's. Now I teach the, in the graduate program in the specialization uh, that is dealing with higher education and college student services. And so I'm interested, and I've been following his career over time from over there. And I'm wondering, um, what is the legacy for higher education, and particularly with respect to the Jesuit uh, kind of social justice grounding foundation? Uh, with respect to the um, high tuition rates, what is uh, the plan, the legacy, what happened in the first governorship as opposed to this one uh, to support students who can't afford a higher education, who uh, possibly are seeing or we are seeing the pendulum swing to mm -hmm. more of an elitist uh, uh, access as opposed to an access for all. And how does that fit, especially at a college like St. Mary's, we really uh, our foundation, our mission is about um, uh, education for the poor. Um, how can students go to school? What are we, what are we gonna I, I do think about this that? Is, What's I, the legacy? Yeah. I think this is one of um, the big challenges, that, and he has mentioned this. I mean, look, Pat Brown, in, in Pat Brown's day, the University of California, first, there was no tuition originally, uh, and now we know what the tuition situation is now. We saw, we've now seen Janet Napolitano, who's, who's taken over, or has had, uh, the University of California, talk about uh, how her, she's going to start pushing the fact that if, if your family makes under $80,000, you do not, you will not have to pay tuition at the University of California. And uh, she's just starting a program now for undocumented students, um, uh, for millions of dollars uh, to, to help them get through. But the fact is, the amount of money California pays in education versus building prisons this is, a, this is an issue that is a huge concern, particularly to the progressive yeah. voters. When Jerry, when Jerry Brown was governor, I covered the UC Regents for the Associated Press. And Jerry used to deliver prissy little lectures to the Regents about how they had to lower their expectations and they had to stretch dollars and all the rest of it. And it used to really bother me that this son of a governor was giving, as I say, prissy little lectures to people who were trying to get college education into the hands of impoverished students, and they were listening to Jerry talk about how they had to be very frugal. Well, let me just bring up one fact that comes out of an article by James Fallows, which appeared in the, in the Atlantic uh, back, I believe, during the summer. He says, despite the state's image of, as being overtaxed, California tax code is so outdated, nearly $1 trillion, half of California's economic output is not taxed. That's because services are not taxed in California. And I don't think that's something Jerry is going to be willing to tackle. He has, in fact, Fallow's article mentions that he has a marked uh, lack of interest in tackling California's problems with governance or the tax structure. Mm -hmm. He. Uh, he is simply, California's Constitution is 110 pages long. It has been amended, I don't know, 400 times, something like that. It specifies that California school teachers had to be paid at least $2,400 a year. Uh, and Jerry, I was asked him about it, and Jerry wasn't the least bit interested in talking about reforming California's system of governance. Because it's practically impossible to do. An, an example, and I would, of course, take issue with Fallow's conclusion on how we're undertaxed, but you know, Brown had said back before, right before Prop 30, he was trying to get the legislature to push through his, his uh, measure to the ballot. He had talked about what a poor public policy it is. Everyone in Sacramento will agree upon this, even Democrats behind closed doors. Our tax system is idiotic because of how reliant it is on the upper end of the income tax bracket. Because sometimes when the economy goes bad, rich people don't make money or income. They're just, but they're still rich, and they also have mobility, and they can leave. A week after declaring that that's bad public policy, he essentially collapsed to the pressure of the California Federation of Teachers, the second tier teacher union in the state, into their proposal, which raised tax on the wealthy. 
a week before, after he had stated it's bad public policy. So he, he, I think he is calculating. He does not have the political muscle to do really what not needs to be done, not that anybody would, which is that our income tax has to become lower and flatter, meaning more people should be paying taxes that don't in order to have a stable, predictive level of tax revenue for the state. Thank you. So it was mentioned by the panel that Jerry Brown knows what the people want prior to them knowing. And it was also mentioned that he likes to take risks. This being said, when he's making and taking uh, on risks, who is he really risking? His position or the people's uh, living environment or just everyday life? Uh, we had a hard time hearing the question. Yeah. Sorry. Can we phrase it and <laughs> Okay. I'm a little nervous. It's a big group. <laughs> okay, so it was mentioned earlier by the panel that Jerry, Jerry Brown knows what the people need prior to them knowing, right? It was also mentioned that he likes to partake in risks. This being said, when making risks, who is he really risking? Himself in, as a governor or the people? In his, in his decision making. A tough one. I think. I mean, I think it depends on the issue you're talking about. Uh, I mean, you're talking about Prop 30. He was willing to take the risk and say, um, "I don't care what the polls say. I think if we're going to get out of this budget mess, we're going to have to. We're going to have to have a tax increase." Um, yet there's other issues where uh, I think it's just because high-speed rail, where maybe it's a risk that he's not doing it for the people because the people. Clearly, don't seem to want it. I, th I think, I mean, Father, you should, because I think you brought yeah. up the issue of he, he'll take risk. But if I understand your question correctly, I, he's risking usually his own political well being, not risking the benefit of the people in most cases. Yes, but his decisions do, in fact, affect the well, people. The, well, they do. And high speed rail, if it wastes a bunch of money, would be an example of that. Going back to his first governorship, Rose Bird was an incredible risk. Mm -hmm. That, from my perspective, did great harm to the state. Obviously, there's different perspectives, but I'll argue that. And it also created great political harm to him. But it was a risky thing to do. There was no good, sound political reason to do that. Yeah. Um, my question is more a uh, general uh, political question. Uh, what makes a politician good in his position? Uh, one or another. You've talked about Jerry Brown as mayor and as governor, the positions that he's held, but can you imagine him and his political um, ideology working as a member of the Senate or a member of the Assembly? And if not, what makes the difference? Well, legislators frequently do not make good administrators. I think uh, one example right, right in our neck of the woods is Ron Dellums, who was a very potent, much respected congressman who became the mayor of Oakland. And it is generally believed that he was a miserable mayor of Oakland. Uh, he, he didn't enjoy pulling the levers of power and doing things that mayors and administrators do. Being a legislator, as these two could testify more than I could, is a far different cry far different activity than being an administrator. And I say that despite the fact that John McCain and Barack Obama both came out of the legislature to run for president. Barack, of course, made it. I think that's a, I think that's a fascinating question. And Pete, Pete Wilson didn't like the Senate, loved being an executive, loved being a mayor, loved being governor. Lyndon Johnson, history would suggest, was better as a Senate leader than as a president. And it, it actually, I mean, now that you've, you, you, you put this question to us, it, it's almost too bad that we will not have seen Jerry Brown as a legislator. Because I'm not so sure he wouldn't have uh, actually enjoyed that. Um, and probably, it would have been, a, well, I think a younger Brown, when he ran for the Senate, of course, in, nine, in uh, 82, that, that would have been interesting. Could he have put together coalitions and got legislation done? I think he probably could have. And I think one other thing that makes, makes people good political leaders is their ability to stay connected to just average people. And I don't, it's, not, it's not like Jerry Brown 
hangs out with average people all the time. But uh, you know, one thing I noticed in covering politics is a lot of times these people get elected and then they keep their circle keeps getting smaller and smaller, and they're riding in the motorcade and they they fail to to stop connecting with it, just average people. And I remember once sitting down with Jerry Brown and saying, you know, come on, do you really ever go to Safeway or what, do you ever get to see what, how the rest of us live? And yet, just yesterday there was a picture of him. Uh, t tweeted uh, shopping at the Trader, Trader Joe's, Joe's in Rockridge. But, but he, had, mean, he had a look on his face like, don't bother me or talk to me. <laughs> yeah, that's his, but, you know, the guy still lives in Oakland. He, like, he runs in Redwood Park. He, well, he still continues to do stuff that kind of keeps him connected to people. Interesting for me, at least, I'm sure for you as well, Cory Booker has just left the mayorship of Newark, New Jersey, my hometown, to become a U.S. senator. It would be very interesting to see what the difference in his yeah. trajectory yeah, that's would a great be. Example. Just a few more questions. Hello, good evening. Oh, he got it from you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, good evening. My question's about Prop 30 and uh, Jerry Brown's personal choice to campaign on its behalf. Uh, very energetically, and I would say even as a cowboy, and uh, what role did that play as a personal choice on his end uh, to directly invest in repaying uh, Wall Street finan financiers that the UC system had been in bed with? Oh. We, we lost some of the questions, so you're gonna have to summarize well, and get slow, and, slow and loud. I need a whole day, because... Yeah, yeah. Please, um, <laughs> can I look? Yeah, yeah, okay, so. Um, well, Jerry Brown, he, he went out very energetically to campaign for Prop 30. Okay. Everybody saw him on TV. And as a student, I personally felt that my education was being held hostage if I didn't go out and vote for this. But how much was that uh, an incentive to repay back a lot of the interest rate swaps that happened with Wall Street bankers that was directly related to uh, bad gambling that a lot of uh, state officials did with Wall Street that is out, that's outsourced, right? That all those activities are outsourced outside of the needs of Californians. So how much was that uh, an incentive for him to simply gain money that he needed to repay back and not really invest in our education? I love your question. I think it's, it's, very, it, it's very intelligent and a very good question that should be asked. Um, putting myself in a somewhat odd position of defending Jerry Brown. Uh, it, I don't, I don't, it didn't have anything, pri it didn't primarily have anything to do with that. And a lot of those bad credit swaps happened at other subdivisions of government uh, with, within the state. The state wasn't as vulnerable uh, on that as other, as lo some local governments were. Uh, so the governor, I mean, the, the governor needed Prop 30 to succeed in order for his governorship to succeed. I mean, it's really as succinct as that. So the things that were on the line, is there a net effect that addresses the issue you're questioning me, questioning us about? It, it certainly is possible. It's probably worth maybe some further examination or good journalism. Okay. But th th it was still about a very macro issue, which is if he won, he was going to have a successful first term and be on his way to reelect. And if he lost, his political capital would have shrunk. He would not have been able to bend the legislature to his will. And um, he probably would have to seriously consider whether he really wanted that second term. And as a strategic point of view, I think you made a good point also. Um, how did that win? He took it around to college students. They, they, were, they were one of the deciding factors in that because he made the case that this is about your education, the future of your education. And if this goes down, that will too. And because those college students could register yeah. up until the last minute, I admire your I admire your cynicism, though, about your education <laughs> being held hostage, because it's certainly that there were, you know, it wasn't your education wasn't going to go away. So. Twenty million dollars is a lot yeah. for me. Me too. Me too. Last question. Um, I've been trying to think of a way to phrase it so that I actually get the answer. Um, that I think we're all trying to hear. So the, the fees and the tuition at the UC colleges and the CSU system are ridiculous right now. So what is the governor doing 
what is he doing to address the fact that the average citizen cannot afford college right now and our debt is skyrocketing? Is he doing anything? And if so, what is he doing? Answer that question. I know that that is, I, if he's sort of vulnerable in, in one area to in, the, to in the coming campaign, if he is, uh, that is something that the Republicans I know are going to be raising, that issue of education, the placement of where, where are California students in the, in the, uh, in the range uh, in terms of performance and so forth, and how the university <coughs> system has become so expensive. Well, and one thing to remember, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is the UC system and CSU system are autonomous. Yeah. Okay, there are regents there. The governor appoints some of those regents to UC trustees to CSU. But they do act autonomously, and um, the purse strings um, from the state, are, it's not all the money those systems obviously deal with. And I think the governor, um, my observation is the governor has been um, much well, as you described in, in his first two terms, has taken on those systems to make sure they are being as lean mm -hmm. as possible. And before the state just flushes more money into these systems to make sure that they undergo reforms uh, that after now five decades of existing, they probably are in sore need uh, to, to go through and have some more self-examination of how efficiently or inefficiently they're being run. Bill Bagley, who was a Republican assemblyman for many years and then became a UC regent, keeps a chart of state support for the UC system. And his chart shows, which he waves around a lot, shows a steady decline, 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 decline in the percent of, of the UC budget that the money is provided by the state. It's just going down, 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 down. You know, the people of California 160 years ago did something remarkable. They began what turned out to be the largest system at, at a time, the largest system of public higher education in the nation. But they did something even more remarkable than that. At the same time they were making the University of California the largest system, they made it the best system of higher public education in the nation. People of California should be very proud of that, and I wish there were a way somehow for Jerry Brown and the legislature to bring back the day when you could get, for very little money, an Ivy League education at Berkeley or UCLA or some of the other UC campuses. You can't do that as easily today as yeah. you could 50 years ago. Uh, and I think the people of California have suffered because of that. And the contribution of the University of California and the CSU system to many of us on the faculty um, is extraordinary. And we have to acknowledge that St. Mary's College of California has benefited in, in a very direct way uh, with faculty members, with the kind of resources, the intellectual resources of a, both a, a, a UC Berkeley and a Stanford that have made such a major impact on us. Well, I want to thank you, first of all, because you're a wonderfully attentive uh, audience with wonderfully important questions. Um, again, I, I want to thank many people who brought this together, Tim Farley, Monica Fitzgerald, Bill Sullivan, Rob Um We thank our panelists. And before we close, I want to show you a, a copy of Chuck McFadden's book, Trailblazer. And I want to just quote Jerry Brown. At the end of uh, Mr. McFadden's book, he, he actually has uh, several appendices of some of uh, Jerry Brown's speeches, most especially his last inaugural speech. And he, he quotes the philosophy of loyalty from a Californian philosopher by the name of Josiah Royce. And he, and he ends his uh, inaugural address with these words. This is Jerry Brown speaking. He says, I have thought a lot about this, and it strikes me that what we face together as Californians are not so much problems, but rather conditions, life's inherent difficulties. A problem can be solved or forgotten, but a condition always remains. It remains to elicit the best from each of us and show us how we depend on one another and how we have to work together. So uh, the challenge tonight is uh, work together, 
leadership is an important part of what we do uh, as citizens and as students, as teachers, and as journalists, and those involved in political life. We thank you, one and all.